Uh, today, I want to talk about Christianity as counterculture. Now, some of you know I have a series of lectures called Toward a Radically Christian Counterculture online. Some of you may have heard those lectures. There's uh, quite a few of them. It's quite a, a long series. I'm not intending to give that series necessarily here, nor even to uh, duplicate what's in it uh, at all. But, oh, there'll be some overlap, probably. Uh, but more, more now in our day, where we are now in history, than when I first taught on that subject uh, 20 something years ago. Uh, the idea of, of, of Christ's kingdom, Christ's people, being a counterculture is, uh, is just something we need to understand more than ever. Uh, there was a time, at least in Western civilization, that the, the culture of Christ and, and of the church could reasonably be not very different than the culture of the average oh, person in America. Most people were influenced by church. Uh, even people who weren't Christians were, had morals and assumptions very similar to those of Christians. When I was young, it seemed to me that all the non-Christians I knew really believed there was a God. And uh, a lot of them believed that the Bible was the Word of God. They just didn't read it or care to follow it. They revered it. Now, that's not the case anymore. Our, <clears throat> the culture of the Christian uh, life, the Christian community, is much more counter to the dominant culture than it ever was in this part of the world uh, in modern history. But we have to take that as the way it's supposed to be in a way. Uh, it's more comfortable for Christians living in a worldly culture that has sympathy for Christian values, obviously. It's easier, but it's one thing is harder, and that's knowing who's really a Christian. When everybody acts like Christians, it's hard to know who really is a Christian. When the dominant culture frowns on acting like a Christian or thinking like a Christian, the ones who still think and act like Christians are the ones that are that stand out. And and from the point of view of the world, they stand out to be targets. But from our point of view, they stand out. It's good for us to see who they are too, because we're we're them, and, and we, you know, we want to be among those who are like-minded. So, in a sense, the counterculture of the church that is supposed to be there. I mean, I, I have to say this. Churches don't always have a counterculture. A lot of times churches flow very much with the dominant culture. They, they feel that that's what they have to be to be relevant. You know, that to be relevant to modern people, you have to be culturally up-to-date in your style and, and all that. And your, even your views. That's why so many churches are uh, waffling now on, on the gay rights issue. Well, I don't think anyone's against gay rights. I'm not against gay rights myself. I think people should have the right to be gay if that's what they are. But I don't think that they should be able to have the right to change definition of marriage and so forth. But that's so, that's so you know, 2015. <laughs> that's, that's like, like that's not even an issue anymore. Things are moving so rapidly, you know. You know, to talk about same-sex marriage isn't, I mean, it's still controversial, but it's not on the radar anymore. That's been settled for our, for our culture, our national culture. And now they're moving on to more and more radical craziness. And um, so we, as the culture moves on, we it should be not going quite as fast and, and maybe not in the same direction at all. Um, some things that change in the culture, styles of music and things like that are harmless enough. Style of dress. Um, you know, um, slang, you know, in a culture changes. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong if it's not bad words, you know, to, uh, to move with the culture, to be up to date. You don't have to dress like, uh, you know, the Amish and, uh, you know, be that removed. The Amish definitely do have a subculture uh, for themselves. And I'm sure that's very valuable to them in, in many ways. But but, but their, their culture is not in touch, really, at very many points with modern, where most modern people live. That doesn't mean they can't, that it's bad for them to do that, but they're, you know, they don't kind of intermingle quite the same way in the real world. That would give them the impact. And most people, even though the Amish do go out uh, among what, what they call the, uh, the Gentiles, um, they go out and they do their business, they sell cattle and, you know, build wagon wheels for them and so forth, they don't, they don't reach out to the world. That is, they're in the world 
they're not at all of the world, but they're not also very involved in trying to reach the world. They're trying to just prevent the world from reaching them. And um, so in that respect, the, the differences in culture between a group like that and the dominant culture are marked, visible, but they're also off-putting to some people. I mean, most people find the Amish somewhat charming, but not something they want to do, not something they want to be, not something that looks like a better way than the way that most people are living. I mean, some people might be attracted to it if, if their life is hectic, but Christian, the Christian community should be living in such a way that our culture, uh, it does seem relevant. And it, that is to say, by not trying to keep up with the dominant culture, uh, we should be relevant to where people's real needs are. The needs of most people is to have stable families. Our dominant culture is not moving in that direction. The, the culture of the church should. You know, uh, most people, uh, you know, don't need to be uh, addicted to drugs and alcohol. No one needs to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, but that's a lot more people are, are in that condition now than when I was younger. Um, the, the culture is, you know, very strong on drinking, and uh, and now marijuana is legal, so a lot more people are using that. Um, you know, it's the culture changes, but in, not in ways that are really relevant to helping people solve the problems of their lives. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, becoming a transgender doesn't. I don't think it enhances lives of people who do it because if it did, their suicide rate wouldn't be like. 10 times higher than that of the average person. You know, I mean, uh, it doesn't sound like it's solving problems for them to be, even though they're recognized. I mean, some people say, well, they're committing suicide because the world's persecuting them. When was the last time anyone in the world persecuted a transgender? They celebrate them. I, I was just told the other day that uh, people are moving toward identifying themselves as transgender because if they do so on Facebook, everybody loves them. Everyone thinks they're special. Everyone treats them uh, as something to be celebrated. Uh, it's, it's the way to be popular on Facebook, is to come out as something other than cisgender, other than, you know, a natural heterosexual person. Uh, so, I mean, the culture is not helping people. And, uh, and if they keep saying, well, you know, these people are depressed because the world's rejecting them. I haven't seen anyone rejecting them lately. Even the churches don't speak out against them very much, and so and why would they care if the church did? They're not part of the church, so what, what do they care what the church thinks? You see, the point is that everything the culture is embracing is bad for people, bad for the people who are caught up in it. And when Jesus came and established his kingdom, it was to be an alternative society with its own culture, and uh, and it would be counter to the dominant culture, and it was. We read uh, in Acts chapter two. <clears throat> the passage is probably very familiar to us all, uh, that on the day of Pentecost, after Peter preached and 3,000 people were uh, converted, <clears throat> in Acts 2.42, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking about the whole community of the 3,000 who were converted, <clears throat> which at the time was the whole church on the planet, it says of them, in verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, and then it says also in verse 44, now all who believed uh, were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among uh, all as anyone had need. Now, what we see here is they had a different culture than everyone else. We're not talking about what the preachers did. We're talking about what the average person did. They apparently met daily or nearly so to do various things, not necessarily all religious things. We often think, because the church has branded itself largely, uh, of the church as a religious movement. Uh, Jesus didn't say anything about starting a religious movement. He started a kingdom, which is, has more of a political connotation than, than religious. Yeah, we worship God. Uh, ancient people worship their king. Uh, Jesus is our king. He's, he's our king. And that means that the community of Christ is a community of obedience to a king. Worship is part of it. But you know that, like God said to, through Samuel to Saul, uh, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is worship. 
sacrifices, going to the temple and worshiping God, you know, in the ritual way. And that was not a bad thing, but it was not as good as obedience. Uh, a disobedient person, a wicked person who's morally <clears throat> disobedient, uh, can't even acceptably offer sacrifices to God. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, it says in Proverbs three times. So it's obvious that God didn't come to make us more religious. He came to make us more obedient to Christ because he's the king. He's the Lord. Response to a king and a Lord is obedience. And so people think of Christianity as an alternative religion to other religions. And it, it is, in a sense, that because we have different, a different God. We have different worship. But the society of the early Christians, though they worshiped, they did a lot of things that weren't really what we call worship. They did things that are socially different economically different. They didn't consider their stuff to be theirs to keep if other people had need, for example. They, they continued in uh, fellowship, which is what, I mean, what people do when they're just hanging out, you know. Uh, they, they were in prayers together. They obviously had a Godward focus and a religious worship involved in their gatherings, but, uh, but they sat under the apostles' teaching, which means they were being educated, in the ways of the kingdom. Uh, they fellowshiped, they broke bread, eating. You know, part of our home, uh, the biggest part of our home church is eating, especially when all this part is over, you know? We eat before, we eat in the middle, we eat at the end. <laughs> Not because we're gluttons. Actually, I don't know if anyone eats too much when they're here, I don't pay attention, but. <laughs> <laughs> but we eat because that's a, that's a sociable thing. Uh, the, the body of Christ was a society. They they socialized. They got they were educated by the apostles. They said in the apostles' teaching, they prayed, so they were obviously worshiping together. And they their economic system was different than the world's outside. They they were doing different things with their lives, not just on Sunday morning, but every day their life was different. Not just a few Christians, but the whole society of the Christians was different. It was, a, it was a collective society with a different culture. And um, it's what set them apart. And it's also, I think, what made them so attractive. Because the apostles preached, and, pe and God added to the church daily people, because I think the church was a good model of the kingdom of God that was being preached. It was a, a visual model. Here's what it's like when a society obeys King Jesus. They're not greedy. They're not selfish. Uh, they're focused toward God and toward other people. Um, they love each other. I mean, that's, that's what a society looks like if they're following the king. And when the disciples go out and preach the kingdom of God, they could say, and here's, you know, exhibit A, you know, these 3,000 people over here living in a society. Now, I don't believe... I don't know, because the Bible doesn't give us enough detail, but I, I don't picture the 3,000 Christians living in a commune. I have to say, when I was a teenager, I kind of pictured it that way, because a lot of my friends lived in that kind of way, and I did too a lot of the time, but as Christians. But um, I have to say that looking at it as an older person, I, I don't see any evidence they lived together, but they sure got together a lot. They, they, were, they were together enough to be <coughs> perceptive, perceived as an alternative society with their own ways different from the world. And it was attractive. I mean, if you imagine finding a group of people who they don't divorce, uh, they don't use drugs and alcohol, uh, they don't sue each other, they're not, you know, uh, addicted to 12-step programs or, or psychological counseling, uh, you know, it's like very different than our modern society. They don't gossip. They don't hate enemies. Uh, they're not greedy. They share among themselves when there's a need. Um, that society would be really attractive to most people, I would think. And it should be, because human beings are made to be in that kind of a society under God. And that's what the Christianity is. It is that countercultural thing. And... Hebrews, of course, tells us to uh, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but to exhort one another regularly. Now, exhort means encourage. That's Hebrews 10, 24. And following, 
people have to get together in order to encourage each other. You see, we can go to church and we can be told what a Christian is supposed to do and how a Christian is supposed to think. But then we go out in the world and everybody else around us thinks differently than that, does differently than that. And in fact, our ways are so strange in their eyes that we almost don't want to put them on display because our ways will bring reproach in many cases because everyone we're around in the world does not understand, does not sympathize. And so, you know, it's kind of people are embarrassed to speak out for Christ, even when they're Christian. I'm, I'm not assuming that's us here at this table, but there certainly are a lot of people who are that way. And uh, so, you know, Paul said he's not ashamed of the gospel. How could you be ashamed of the truth? How can you be ashamed of, having, of knowing what's right and wrong? How can you be ashamed of having a relationship with God and having a king who's the, conquered all the demonic powers? How could you be ashamed of that? There's nothing to be ashamed of, but there's social pressure to make you feel embarrassed to not be conforming. And Paul said in, first, uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We got to think differently than the world. Uh, we have a different worldview than they have, and this is where I, I think we. I assume most of you know a lot about the worldviews. That's a word, a word that's been used a lot in the last several decades. Uh, a worldview, of course, is your the glasses you look at things through. It's not what you you don't look at your worldview very often, but you look at everything through it. It's like C.S. Lewis said, "I believe in Jesus." Sort of for the same reason I believe in the sun and the light of the sun. Not because I see it, but I see everything else through it. It's, it's sunlight gives me the, the ability to see everything else differently than it when there's no light. And, you know, it's not just that we have different beliefs, but the beliefs we have found, form a foundation for the way we look at everything. And that's how worldviews are. Unbelievers have worldviews too. There's only few basic worldviews, the theistic worldview, which is what Christians have, the belief in God. Uh, there's, a, of course, a naturalistic worldview that says there's nothing but nature. Uh, there's the monistic worldview of the Eastern religions, which everything is one. Uh, there's a few things like that, and they see, those who have a worldview like that see everything through it. And uh, this is why we see things so differently than those around us who aren't Christians. Which wasn't always the case if you're old enough and been a Christian long enough to remember uh, 50 years ago. Non-Christians tended to see a lot of things through a Christian <laughs> worldview, even if they weren't Christians, because the society had adopted so many Christian ideas, assumptions. There's a God, you know, uh, being faithful to one spouse is a good thing, you know, uh, should be of the opposite sex. You know, those kinds of things were assumed. No one, it, it wasn't until ultra in modern times that anyone began to question those things. But now they're all thrown up in the air and come down randomly and crazily into a, a worldview that basically is whatever pleases you, no one else should be able to judge you for it. Mm -hmm. well, you know, whatever you want, just follow your impulse. Uh, don't, don't control yourself. Don't deny yourself. And because of those kinds of things, we look really different because if we're really following Jesus, we're saying the opposite things to that. And we're more and more in the minority in certain parts of the world, including this part. We used to be very much a majority, I think, of people who think like we do, whether Christian or not. So the Christians who are going to be faithful to Christ and have his worldview and, and live you know, our, our cultural way as Christians are going to be more and more, frankly, despised as a, as a crazy kind of minority. Uh, and it's only because we believe what we do about Christ and only because we have God in our thinking that we don't move from it. You see, a lot of people thought like we do 50 years ago, but they didn't have God really in their life. So when the culture moved, they moved with the culture. There's nothing to root them to thinking like the way we do. But we have something that does root us to it. You know, we know that God has spoken. We know that God has told us these things. We, we're not at liberty to shift with the culture. And so... As the tide changes in the modern culture, um, it tends to be, we, we tend to be going against the tide. Um, and that's, we feel it more right now than we did 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, certainly. Um, 
I want to talk about what makes the Christian culture different than the world's culture right now. So it will be, we need to define it and know it. We kind of feel it. Maybe you have sat down and defined it, but most people don't. They just feel like, wow, everyone's thinking differently than I do. But to realize that there's a consistent worldview that the Christian has um, will make you more comfortable with the difference. Being different is okay. You know, it's a lot of Christians find themselves a little embarrassed when an atheist says, um, you know, how can you worship God when he had the Israelites go and wipe out all those Canaanites, men, women, and children? You know, what kind of God is that? Isn't that like a jihad? Isn't that as bad as the worst in Islam? How can you, you know, support a God like that? Well, it's, it's a little embarrassing if you're not quite sure how to get your ideas across. It's even more so if you don't know why you believe what you believe. But if you know why you believe, but you know you can't tell them, what do you do? What I usually try to explain when that kind of thing comes up is, we're coming from two different worldviews. I have as much right to mine as you have to yours, but they are different. A worldview is not something that you necessarily have to defend. It's just something you adopt. Fortunately, the Christian worldview is the only one that can really be defended rationally, but most people don't care to defend their worldview. They just adopt it. It's just the way they see things. It's just their cultural outlook. And there's certain things about the Christian worldview that's going to make it stand out more, and we're just going to, have to be aware of it and not be ashamed of it. And that is, first of all, of course, uh, the Christian worldview is focused on the reality of God, which it seems so strange to have to say that since until, uh, until modern, very modern times, almost all reasonable people thought there's probably a God. And atheism is really making a, uh, you know, an resurgence, uh, but not because it has good arguments, but because people who don't know why they believed in God can't think of what those what the reasons are they did uh, in many cases. But we believe in God for excellent reasons. We, we know there's plenty of evidence for God, and there's no evidence that's ever appeared to say there's none. See, this is, what, this is what you have to do. You have to be not cowed by people who have a different set of presuppositions, realizing that their presuppositions don't have any defense Suppose someone says, you know, I, don't, I used to believe in God. I, I began to not feel so much so sure of it. Now, now I'm kind of, I guess my view is I don't, I guess there's no God. Well, they feel like they've just made some kind of a, a shift that's justifiable uh, in light of the fact they don't have that much evidence for God. But they don't have any evidence for no God. There is no way you can have evidence that there's no God. You simply can't prove a, a universal negative. You don't have evidence for it. If we say there's no such thing as a black swan, well, we're only saying that I've never seen one. In another part of the world, there might be, and as it turns out, there are, but the British always thought there were only white swans, and it was in their encyclopedias. So, swans are white until they conquered or found, discovered in Australia, and there's black swans there. But it, it changed their whole idea. Oh, okay, we thought there were none, but now we found out one of the places we had never looked before, there was one of those, you know, those kind of, that species. And that's how, you know, when you try to prove that something doesn't exist anywhere, you have to first prove that you've been everywhere, that you've seen everything there is to see, that no one has ever experienced or discovered anything that you have not yet discovered. It's just a, an irrational, absurd worldview to say there's no God. One could say, I theorize that there's no God, but you can't, you can't make, live your life on something you're not sure of. An atheist like Richard Dawkins, he's sure there's no God, but he can't provide any evidence that there's none. What he can do is mock Christians, but he can only mock the most foolish and silly Christians. He never actually, in his books, he never really represented intelligent, you know, sophisticated Christians who've thought through their views. He always mocks the, you know, the people carrying signs that say God hates fags, you know, and, and who go to military funerals and say God killed your son, you know, those kind of weirdos. You know, that's the, that's the kind of Christians that you, they have to present to, to prove there's no God. But how does that prove there's no God? How, how, does, how does what any Christian does prove there's no God? They might prove that they're not very good representations of any God that may be, or they may prove that they don't really believe in God. But the point is, believing there's a God is the most sensible of options, and we don't have to be ashamed of knowing there's a God. Because we have experience that unbelievers don't. We've been born again. 
we've had prayers answered. We, you know, we've, uh, we live in a reality that they're unaware of. Uh, and, and, and we can't prove it to them by saying those things. If we say those things, they'll just say, well, that's just your subjective opinion. Well, think what you want about it. I know what I know. I know I was blind and now I see, you know. I mean, I know that I'm a different person than I was before. And, uh, you know, you explain it any way you want to. I know the explanation because I experienced it, you know. And, and of course, our best, our best arguments for God are not the subjective ones, but they are real ones. Uh, the, the objective evidences for God are, are quite good, and they, they do better in debate with atheists than, uh, than just your personal testimony. But your personal testimony is how you really know. You know, you can know all the arguments for God, but unless you've experienced God, you don't know. You just believe that that's the best evidence that points that direction. But we know things that they don't know. We can't prove it to them. And, and that's what I think we feel uncomfortable because we can't prove it. And therefore, they're going to say we look, they make us look silly, they think. I don't feel silly. I think they look silly. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think their arguments are lame. But we have to just be like, you know, Daniel in Babylon or Joseph in Egypt and say, you know, these people are all worshiping weird gods or they're doing different things differently. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to be right, you know, and it's not arrogant. You know, if I've learned something by having been somewhere that they haven't been and they don't and they want to deny what I know, that's theirs to worry about. We live our lives with the awareness that God made us, that God watches us, that God will judge us that God has a will for our life, that he's involved in our lives, that's a different worldview than non-Christians have. See, even Muslims and probably Jews who believe in God, they don't, they don't walk with God dwelling inside of them. But only Christ, that's uniquely Christian. It's uniquely Christian for God to put his spirit inside his people and to dwell in them and form them into his own body on earth. That's a, that's a worldview thing that we have that no one else has. And that obviously makes a big difference. If someone doesn't uh, think God's watching or doesn't think there is a God, they obviously don't have anything above them to judge them except the government. And if they can avoid the government eye, they can get away with whatever they want to. But if you believe there's a God who's watching you and he's taking account, that changes everything. And that's one reason why when we see unbelievers behaving as they do and affirming the things they do, it just seems so crazy to us. They, they don't fear God, you know? Uh, they'll go out and damage other people's property, damage other people they don't even know, uh, just because they're frustrated, angry, unhappy people. But we think, well, if I was frustrated and unhappy like that, I wouldn't go out and do those things because I fear God. Mm -hmm. As a Christian, I might get frustrated, I might get unhappy, I might even get angry, but, I'm not, but I fear God too much to do those kinds of things. And we think, how can people be so dislodged from any morality or from any conscience? Well, they don't know God. They think there isn't one. And, you know, atheists like Richard Dawkins over in England, they, a few years ago, had a campaign. They got signs on buses and stuff saying, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to believe in God to be good. And they, you know, atheists like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and so forth, they, they make it very clear, you know, you guys think we can't be good just because we're atheists. You know, you don't have to believe in God to be good. Well, you have to believe in God to know what good is. You can be good simply because you have a residual conscience that a society that was Christian at one time that you were raised in has Im imbued this conscience in you that is based on Christianity. But you're trying to throw out the foundation of that and maintain the, you know, the fruit of it. You tear the roots out, but still have the fruit. It's not going to work out. The, the truth is, an atheist can be good. I mean, as much as a secular person can be. They can do good deeds and so forth. But they can't make a good argument why they should. If there's no God, there's no real reason why anyone should be good. Or, or there's no way to know for sure what is good. So we have ethics. We have, we have morality in our worldview. It's rooted in the first point, that there's a God. And... Because of that, we simply cannot and will not go the way the culture is going away from God. It's when people say you can be good without God. Well, you can be good without God if you still have a strong 
godly influence residual after you've decided there's no God, but you still have all the same morals that you accumulated when, or that were accumulated by people who did believe there was a God. You get far from the Bible, as our society is doing, and they don't, it's awfully hard for them to be good, apparently, because they're not being good. You know, the, the, the average non-Christian, uh, or the average person who doesn't believe in God, doesn't have a, uh, the Christian framework of, of even secular society anymore to instill in them what's good. I mean, little kids in kindergarten and first grade have been taught perversion. And believe me, when they're teenagers, unless God gets a hold of them, they're not going to have a clue what's righteous and what's not. Most don't already, but especially when it comes to sexual morality. Most have no idea what norms are. It's, uh, that's why our worldview is so important. We have ethics and morals that are dictated by the fact that there's a God. And because there's a God, we also have uh, a, a basis for the dignity of human life. That's why we're against abortion. That's why we're against all forms of murder. That's, but not just murder, but even harming human beings in any way. The Bible says, love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We don't want to hurt people because we see them as made in the image of God. If you look at Genesis 9, 6, that's the first place that murder was uh, identified as a, as a bad thing in the Bible. Um, unless we take God's confrontation with Cain, but Cain didn't actually have to die for his murder or his deeds, but after the flood, that became mandated. And God said this to Noah after the flood in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood should be shed, for in the image of God he made man. Now, I can kill a cow and eat it. I can kill almost, I can kill any species I want to, but I can't kill a man or a woman because they are made in the image of God. That, that's the distinctive of human existence is that we are made in the image of God that gives human beings, even our enemies, a dignity because they bear, they bear the image of God too. That makes it wrong for us to wrong them, to harm them. In, in James chapter 3, this idea that man is made in the image of God um, becomes the basis for him saying we shouldn't even say bad things about people. We shouldn't curse them. We shouldn't slander them and so forth. In James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, James said, uh, with our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it, that is our tongue, we curse men who have been made of the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. So not only do we not kill human beings, we don't curse them, we don't badmouth them, because there's a dignity in someone being made in the image of God. If somebody bears... God's image, and all humans do, we have to treat them with dignity. That's why we don't kill babies. That's why we don't, uh, that, that's why we care about truth. We don't want to malign people. I mean, I mean, in the last few years, there's been so much lying about, uh, about politicians by the other side. I mean, I mean, think of how many lies became currency through the media about the previous administration, the previous president. I mean, how many average, how many people on the average that you meet outside of the, out of the maybe conservative circles, how many of them know that Mr. Trump never said some Nazis are very fine people? I mean, the media has been pumping that lie, but they don't care. He's, he's just an enemy. They don't think of him as a man made in God's image. They don't see him as somebody that you injure him, and God takes personal offense. Anyone. I, frankly, the same thing about Biden. I didn't vote for Biden, but frankly, I mean, if, if somebody wronged him, I would be upset with them doing so. I, you know, whether, I don't care if a political friend or enemy. He's a human being. He's made the image of God. Now, I can criticize him, and I, in fact, I can criticize myself or anyone else if, they, if there's something worthy to criticize there. That's not the same thing as wronging them, uh, you know, slandering them, destroying their reputation uh, when they're innocent of something to make them look like they're not innocent. That's, that's because the world outside doesn't honor human life anymore. They, they see people as either expedient or not expedient to their 
goals. And if somebody's, uh, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum from them, then they see them as someone who has to be silenced, maybe eliminated. And, uh, but see, that's, that's, part, that's the loss of a Christian worldview that we used to have in this country. Now the Christian worldview is a countercultural view. It used to be the dominant culture for the most part. But now it's counterculture. We have to realize that. I'm, we're standing in the face of a, of a stiff wind trying to blow us a different direction than we've always wanted to go and, and planned to go. And we can't move from it because it's dictated by God. Human equality is, is something that almost everybody in this country thought was a good thing. And most people who were in countries that didn't have structures of equality wanted to move here because they knew that a society where men are created equal and are viewed that way is a, the best kind of place to live. That's, it's still what Christians hold. I mean, Paul said there's no Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free, you know, racially, sexually, um, economically, people are all equal in Christ. And even outside of Christ, we recognize them. Uh, we, don't, we don't judge people by the group they belong to, uh, by the race they are. I mean, really, I, I don't know any Christians who do. There might be people in the churches who are racist or sexist or something like that. I don't know if I know any real Christians who hate any group or, or feel like one group is you can wrong them just because they're of a different race or sex or something than themselves. That's just not a Christian way of thinking. Christians don't think that way. Because Christ teaches, God teaches, that we're all made of one blood. We've all come from one family line. Now, outside of the Christian worldview, the dominant worldview is indicating that, you know, to say everyone's equal is, is a racist thing to say. You've heard that, I'm sure. It used to be that the anti-racist position was to say, all races are equal. And of course they are in the sight of God and in the sight of a Christian. But now if you say all races are equal, you're being a racist because you're supposed to say, no, the minority races are superior. That's, I mean, that's, that's true. You are called a racist. If, you, if someone says, do you believe black lives matter? And you say, well, I believe all lives matter. That's a racist statement. That's going to be a racist statement. At one time, it was the only sensible thing that intelligent people would say. And, and intelligent people still say it. But, but you know, outside the biblical worldview, people are not equal. <coughs> uh, certain groups are more important than other groups. And at this particular moment in time, I mean, what I'm saying now might not be timely five years from now, but, or even next year, but at this point in time, the big fad is to say that everyone who's white is a racist by virtue of being white, and that we're all white supremacists. I honestly, I don't know if I've ever met a white supremacist, honestly. Most of the people I know are white, like myself, but, but I don't think I've met one who's a white supremacist. It's, it's just that anti-white racism is now in vogue. But you can't have racism last in a world where there's uh, a Christian worldview. Now, I realize people say, well, well this you know, charming Christian America of 100 years ago, uh, they had racism, they had slaves and things like that. It's true, but not, it wasn't a Christian worldview. I mean, there were, there were much more influences of Christianity in more areas of life in our culture 100 years ago than right now, probably. But still, it wasn't a perfectly Christian society. The more Christian, the more true to Christian principles society becomes, the less you're going to see any residual racism or anything else that, that divides people into categories that some are important or others are not, or some can be exploited and oppressed and others cannot. That's just, there's no place for that in Christianity. Now, some of us might say, well, didn't Paul tell slaves to be subject to the masters? Yeah, but he, he also told the masters not to oppress them. There's nothing wrong if a man wants to be a slave if that's what is going to make him economically secure. And most people who sold themselves into slavery did so because they were economically on the rocks. And therefore, they sold themselves into slavery for economic security. If someone wants to voluntarily do that, who can say they shouldn't be allowed to do that? But, but no one should be kidnapped from their home and made a slave. You know, like, like in modern sex trafficking or, of course, 
ancient uh, African slavery uh, from over 100 years ago. That's, that's sinful, but it's, it's, it's not sinful for someone to want to indenture himself to serve someone. That's not the issue. People should have freedom to do what they want to do. And the more, the more a culture is taking on Christian values, the, the more there's going to be that human equality recognized universally. Of course, in a worldview, every worldview deals with things like origins, ethics, and uh, destiny. And Christians have a unique sense of destiny. The Christian worldview makes our destiny is to be like Christ. It says in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And it says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. That is, we have this destiny of to be like Jesus. We're going to be like him. And if that destiny is held in view, it leads us to want to purify ourselves. That is, to, to conform to that likeness of Jesus. And that's, that gives us a different goal. If you don't have that as your destiny in mind, especially if you don't believe there's any destiny other than death, and there's nothing after that, of course, then I, I'm not sure exactly what remains to cause someone to have a meaningful life in any way. Uh, you know, if, if everyone just lives out their 70, 80 years, and then they're done, and they, they don't exist anywhere ever again, well, in the scheme of eternity, their 70 years were worth nothing at all. It's, I mean, even, even if they made a big impact, even if they made their society a better place, and when they die, the benefits they brought have continued. They won't continue forever. In the scheme of eternity, unless people last forever, they don't mean anything in the long run. Mm. You know, I mean, think about it. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Uh, civil rights movements did a great deal to you know, bring more equality for blacks and so forth. But now those people are dead. Martin Luther King is dead. He did a great deal to elevate, you know, equality with blacks and whites. But now the modern social justice warriors, they don't like Martin Luther King. He, he just wanted everyone to be equal. They don't want to be equal. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln is considered to be a racist now. That's why they're tearing down his statues. You know, here, someone, you can live your life out, and even if there's no heaven or hell, if you do something to improve society for the next generations, you know, you might say, well, that was worth doing. But if three generations later, they undo everything you did, and eternity goes on, time goes on, what good was it even to live? If, the, if you don't have a goal that has eternal ramifications in mind, there really isn't anything to give real meaning to existence at all. And uh, the goal of being like Jesus is a distinctly Christian goal. To reign with him, to be with him, to, to uh, be in fellowship with him forever. That's a goal that motivates Christians to do the things they do, including to suffer and be martyrs if necessary. Because they have something for that. They have something they, die, they will die for. And therefore they have something to live for. If you won't die for any particular thing, then you have nothing you really should have any reason to live for. Because you're going to die. And if there's no meaning beyond that, then there's no meaning before that. You know? If there's no meaning to your life after you're dead, there's not really any real meaning before you're dead. It's just a meaningless existence. So the Christian worldview is holistically um, gratifying and true, and so is everything together that has to be sewn together. And as soon as you get away from that worldview, everything falls apart. And so we have to be faithful to the genius of Christianity. The genius of Christianity is the, is the reality of, of the things God has revealed. And we, you know, we need to be faithful to those to, to death. Other parts of the Christian counterculture have to do with, of course, our attitude toward authority. We recognize that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And therefore, all governments have to submit to him. If they don't, they're bunk. You know, I mean, they, there's no authority of God, whatever he ordains. So if the governments don't follow God, don't, don't follow his authority, their authority is not worth anything. Uh, even, even the authority of fathers in their homes, which used to be kind of universally recognized. It's not recognized anymore because the biblical views of authority are simply not embraced anymore. Egalitarianism is much more popular 
in the dominant culture where nobody uh, should ever have to submit to anybody else. Mm -hmm. This began, of course, I think, primarily, of course, with the, the, the American Revolution, where we threw off the authority of kings. And everybody, you know, were ruled, a country ruled by the people themselves. And then, of course, when slavery was abolished, which was a good thing, by the way, it should have never been practiced. But when it was abolished, it also reemphasized that, hey, nobody should have an authority over anyone else. No one should be a servant of anyone else. And then, of course, the women's movement came along, and women shouldn't have to be subject to their husbands. Why would that, why would that be right? You know, they're human beings too. So eventually, there was no hierarchy left. Eventually, in the minds of people, nobody can tell me what to do. And no one can, you know, no one can claim to be ruler over me. Well, of course, once you've eliminated all those positions of authority, you've got no analogy for your relationship with God either. I mean, when the, when the Bible tries to teach us about God's authority, it describes him as a king, as a lord of slaves, as a husband, I mean, as a father. One thing they haven't totally done is overthrow the parental authority yet, but they're working on that. Back even in the 90s, there was a strong push under the Clinton administration to pass, for America to pass, as many nations have, the United Nations International Treaty for the Rights of the Child. But it had nothing to do with the rights of children. It had to do with taking rights from parents and giving them to the state. Basically, taking away parental rights and giving the state the rights over your children. Fortunately, that didn't pass. And to my mind, it hasn't passed in America yet. But there was all kinds of things that that treaty made provision for that simply meant parents cannot discipline their kids, parents can't give their kids chores without paying a minimum wage, you know, parents, parents can't do anything because uh, in a totally egalitarian society, kids have all the same rights as anyone else has. Egalitarian means everyone's on the same footing. Now, we can believe in equality without believing in egalitarianism. I believe my children are of equal value to me, but when they're young, they're under my roof, they're under my authority. Uh, I believe that, you know, um, I'm of equal value to the policeman, but he can pull me over if I'm driving too fast and give me a ticket and I have to pay the fine. I'm under his authority. He's not a better man than I am necessarily. He might be, but he probably isn't. But that doesn't matter. He's equal to me. I'm equal to him, but he's in a position of defined authority. That's what a marriage is. That's what parenting is. That's what government is. It's, it's hierarchical as opposed to egalitarian. And we recognize authority because God has ordained authority. We recognize we're all going to answer to God. Whereas the person who doesn't have that in their worldview, they don't have any real authority anywhere. They just assert their own authority when they think they can get away with it. But they don't have any. They don't have any basis for it. Why should I obey you? Because you're stronger than me? I mean, a lot of people have assumed that the reason that wives historically have been subject to their husbands is because husbands have been stronger. You know, husbands are bigger, usually, than their wives. They can force their way on their wives. That's not why wives have traditionally been subject to their husbands. I mean, maybe among Neanderthals that was so, but ever since God revealed himself and his plans, God wanted wives and husbands to relate, relate like Christ in the church. That the authority of Christ over the church is illustrated in a, in a Christian family. That's, that's what it's for, and that brings us to the whole idea of family, too. That's another area of Christian counterculture that's so different from modern culture. You know, modern culture doesn't even have any more a definition of family that all would agree with, or a definition even of marriage. You know, when it came time to, for the, the gays to assert their right to marry and to get the laws changed so that we have to recognize same-sex marriage as marriage, what they did is they destroyed the, the historic definition of marriage, but they didn't replace it with anything. I mean, what is it now? What is the definition of marriage? Is it a man and a woman? Is it two men, two women? A man and a dog? A man and three women? You know, a woman and three men? I mean, what, what definition exists? They, they didn't redefine, they undefined. They eliminated all definition for marriage, leaving it open for any definition to be embraced by anyone who wants to. It's like, uh, this trend is to remove words from our language. That's why there's so many words you can't use anymore. It's common, harmless words. He and her, you know, she and him. I mean, this is, in some cases, you can get thrown in jail, honestly, for using those words. If the person you're talking about or two doesn't like those words being used. I mean, 
to destroy language is to destroy the possibility to think. It certainly is, to destroy language means you can't, if they go far enough with destroying language, you can't think in terms of categories of truth. You can't communicate truth. I mean, everything comes down to language or words. But the word marriage, it doesn't have a definition in our society anymore. The word family doesn't. You know, for a little girl to have two dads and no mom, that's a family as far as some people are concerned. But that's not what a family is. That's just what the dominant culture has decided at this moment to do, is just say anything can be a family. You just call it one. You can be any gender you want. Just call yourself that. And everyone else has to, everyone else has to honor that. Everyone has to celebrate that. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't want we don't, uh, don't to pick on people or abuse people if we disagree with what they're saying, but, but we don't have to accept it. Now, of course, legally, it might, in fact, be mandatory for us to accept it at some point, but we don't have to obey those laws. We don't have to live by lies. We don't have to, you know, just let random people who don't have any basis for their beliefs dictate what we believe. We have to recognize that Christian culture needs to return to divorce-free, heterosexual, lifelong marriages. Now, that might seem a strange thing to say with as many people in this room, as my, including myself, who've been married more than once. Uh, well, marriages sometimes break up. They shouldn't. In a Christian culture, no one should be committing adultery. Now, uh, of course, people can die in a Christian culture, and then you might marry someone, a second person. But, I mean, we're living in a world where not everyone's participating in the world as a Christian. And because of that, you can't hold a marriage together if both people don't want to. You can if both want to. But if one doesn't, nothing in our society will make people stay together. No court in the land will say, you made vows, you made a contract, you got a license from the state to, to honor that contract, you cannot walk away from that contract. Not a court in the land will ever uphold that contract. Uh, it's the only contract they won't, by the way. You can you make any a business contract, and they'll uphold it in court. But, you know, one that, that affects morality, the well-being of children, you know, the, the foundation of society, uh, that contract's not worth defending. Just anyone can walk away from it anytime they want. But it shouldn't be so. Christians should not allow it. In the Christian community, they'd say, you cannot walk away from that contract. Now, of course, if your partner walks away and walks away from God, well, that leaves you in a different position. If your partner dies, that leaves you in a different position. But you can't just say, you know, we're not happy this way. We've got to change. But that's how it is in the dominant culture. People can leave as soon as it's not convenient or happy or sexy or anymore to be with the same person. Uh, Christians have to hold to biblical norms. Jesus said in Matthew 19, uh, you know, divorce was permitted by Moses because of the hardness of heart, but from the beginning it was not so. God made male and female and meant for them to be one flesh. He said, what, what God has bound together, don't let anyone tear apart. So Christians have to stand against the tide of the dominant culture on family issues, authority issues, and also even on personal property issues, because now it's much more popular to move in the direction of socialism or even Marxism, uh, where the idea is, you know, you don't really own that. You earned it, it may be, but the state has every right to take it from you and give it to somebody else if they like them better than you, you know? They can tax you arbitrarily. They can raise the tax levels to whatever will, will be below the level that you'll revolt over. And... Uh, and then they can take what you have and give it to any cause they want. They can support Planned Parenthood, even though you hate Planned Parenthood. They can support the public schools, although you'd never put your kids there. Uh, you know, they can, they can give it to uh, you know, drug addicts who will just spend it on drugs. Uh, they can do anything they want with it because it's not yours. It's the state's. No, not in a Christian worldview. The Christian worldview is justice says you earned it. It's yours to do with what you want. Now, a Christian, of course, says, I earned it, it's mine to do what I want, and I want to yield it to God. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to recognize God's ownership of me and everything else, so I'm going to use it to please God. But it's me that gets to decide that, not the state, not someone else. Somebody else doesn't get to come and say, well, you know, your Christian faith tells you you should help the poor, 
and you're not doing it as much as we think you should, so we're going to take this portion of what you own and give it to, to, to poor people that we approve of. They may be people who, who don't work. They may be people who live immoral lives. But hey, we own your money. Why? Why do they own my money? What did they do to earn it? They have bigger guns than I have, and that's why they own, they own the only way they own my money is if they have bigger guns than I have, really. And they do. <laughs> They do. We all pay our taxes, even if we're grumbling, saying this is not fair, this is not just. We do anyway because we don't want to go to jail. There's, there's, a, there's an army out there, a police force, that's, uh, that will take you in. So, but that's robbery still. I mean, if someone takes something from you at gunpoint or doesn't even pull the gun out, but just says, you know, <laughs> you know you go to jail if you don't do this, well, that doesn't make it less a crime. That's just, that's just a robbery. Ar that's just armed robbery. You know, as opposed to some other kind. But Jesus defined, well, actually, the Old Testament does, but Jesus confirmed it, that people own the property that they earn or lawfully obtain. And it's for them to decide what they do with it. I mean, even the Old Testament law, you should not steal, presupposes that. How could I steal if everyone has as much right to my property as I do? They can take it. But if I have more right to it than they have because I earned it, then them taking it is wrong. Excuse me, it's stealing. Okay. Hiccup there in the middle. In chapter 20 of Matthew, Jesus himself confirmed this idea of property rights. And this is the last point I'm going to really make here. In Matthew 20, Jesus tells this story about workers who get hired at different times of the day by the same man to work in his vineyard or his field and he promises the first group, he hires them in the morning, promises them a denarius for a day. Now, that was a normal day's wage for a laborer. That was a fair wage. They, they were glad to take it. They were happy to work for a day's wage. But at different times in the day, he went out and found other unemployed people, and he didn't tell them what they, he paid them. He just said, come work, and I'll give you whatever's fair. And so people went to work at different stages during the day. And at the end of the day, the paymaster was told to give all of them a denarius. And yet some had worked only an hour, some had worked three hours, some had worked six hours, some had worked all day. And the ones who got what they bargained for, but had worked all day for it, and it was a fair wage, they complained. They complained because people who worked less than them got the same wage. Now, it does seem a little unfair in a way, but, but the master corrects them, and this is the words of Jesus. I mean, we know that Jesus approved of this, because this is the very point of his parable. In Matthew 20, verses 13 through 15, it said, but he answered the one, uh, one of them, the complainers, and said, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did I not agree with, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man uh, the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil? That is, are you greedy because I'm good? Now, notice this. He said, it's lawful for me to do what I want to with my stuff. Now, he wasn't using this principle as an excuse for being greedy or, or, or depriving people of things. He was actually giving them exactly what they bargained for a day's wage. He's using that to say, I have the right to be more generous than that if I want to. Of course, a man doesn't have the right to bargain to pay someone something and say, well, it's my money, so I'm not going to pay you. No, you have to pay what you agreed to. But you can pay more and no one can complain because you didn't give them more. You see, it's yours. You earned it. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with my stuff? Now, Jesus put that in the, the, the mouth of the owner, but of course the owner's kind of in God's position there, but he expects his, his audience to realize, well, that's very reasonable, of course. It's his money. He can give more to someone else. Say, who, who could argue against that? It was taken as a given that if you earned it or you lawfully obtained it, maybe you inherited it from someone else who earned it and wanted to give it to you. Um, well, You've got the right to do that. No one has the right to say, because you did a generous thing for this person, you have to be equally generous with me. Well, not so. The private property ownership is the opposite of socialism or Marxism. And I'm not saying this to be political. I'm saying this because the culture of our society has moved in that other direction toward Marxism. And the Christian culture is not going that way. It can't because it means... Marxism simply means the government has the right to take anything they want from anyone. 
and give it to anyone else they want to. And yet the Bible doesn't ever indicate that the government is more moral or wise or good or, or uh, you know, righteous than anybody else. I'm always amazed by people who think, you know, I want to give more to the government so they can distribute my money. Who do you think these people are that you're calling the government? They're lawyers. Almost all of them are lawyers who ran for office and got someone to vote for them. There are many of them very corrupt, as lawyers often are. And they think, I trust them more than I trust me to be able to help the poor with my money. No, I don't. I don't trust them. And, and anyone who's ever trusted the government has, shown, has been proven to be a fool. So, I mean... All these things we differ from the dominant culture about. We differ about whether it's a God we answer to. We differ about, you know, the value of human life and human dignity made in the image of God. We differ, therefore, on ethics. Uh, we, we differ on human equality. Uh, we differ on property rights, uh, we, on family, on authority. All these things are like major aspects of a culture. Different cultures have different answers to those issues. But Christianity has one answer. And uh, again, there was a time when America's culture was very much in line with Christian culture on most issues, but not so now. And so now we have to be prepared to be a counterculture. And a counterculture isn't always welcomed by the dominant culture because it says the dominant culture is flawed and we're not gonna go with it. You know, the hippies were called the counterculture back in the 70s. And they weren't really more righteous than anyone else, but they thought they were. And basically, they were counterculture, saying the materialism, the you know military-industrial complex, Vietnam, all these things are so corrupt. Uh, you know, we have a different culture that's better, like free love, drugs, <laughs> rock and roll. You know, I mean, that was a counterculture. It wasn't an improvement. It was not a better culture, but it was counter to the dominant one, and it wasn't very much appreciated by the dominant culture. But now that former counterculture is now the dominant culture. They were the ones, you know, interested in Marxism and all that stuff. Uh, and now the dominant culture is. And the Christians who have remained faithful to Christ remain uh, a counterculture now that has to stand for right, even if they try to stomp us out. And they, they will try. How far they will get, we do not know. Uh, they will not destroy the kingdom of God. There's nothing the devil and his people and the world can do to eliminate the kingdom of God. They've had more powerful ways uh, people doing it when it was much smaller and much easier to crush than now that didn't manage it. There's, uh, the, the kingdom of God cannot be destroyed. But, of course, individuals, churches in certain countries can be stamped out. Do you know that most of the Middle East, most of the Arab world was Christian back in the 4th century? Very vibrantly Christian, but Islam came and, you know, basically dominated there. If you were a Christian living that time in those places, you'd say, wow, Christianity has been wiped out, you know, because it is in their area. It'll, re it'll come back. But uh, we're living in the area now where it's being stopped on. It, they may manage to get rid of us here, but they won't get rid of us worldwide. And uh, the kingdom of God will, will pop up again. In power and you know, the, the forms that oppose it, the kings of the earth who conspire together against the Lord and his anointed, he sits in heavens and laughs and he'll have them in derision. And he'll, uh, of course, eventually the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he'll reign forever. But uh, we're living at a time where our cultural faithfulness as the, as the church community, the followers of Christ, uh, is, is going to be clashing more and more against a dominant culture that doesn't have any rationality or, or, or spiritual foundation to it, but people like sheep are just following, you know, what they're told to do. And I was just thinking about, I was just thinking about the mask wearing and some of these things that are controversial now and how it seems like most of the people who are against wearing the mask, the COVID mask, you know, they tend to be on the conservative side, a lot of Christians. Whereas the people who seem to want to wear them and are all paranoid, they're mostly liberals. It, it, that's probably not universally the case, but that's how it tends to fall out. I was thinking, you know, well, I was thinking of the mask issue yesterday because I was in a store where some people weren't wearing masks, which is fine with me. I, I wouldn't wear one either, except I'm not there to rock the boat. But 
But I was thinking, you know, my views on, on COVID, my responses are based on science. Theirs are based on compliance. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have any science behind their, act, their, their uh, positions and their paranoia, but they, they comply with the powers that be. They're, they're slaves of the dominant culture. They just want to comply. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to be disliked. They don't want to be embarrassed. And that's where Christians have to be of a totally different mind. Well, maybe I will be despised. Maybe, I, maybe they will try to embarrass me. Maybe they will try to, you know, exclude me. But isn't that really what they did to Jesus? Isn't that what the apostles faced? Isn't that what Christians throughout the world have faced throughout history? It's not something that's a strange thing. Peter said, don't think of a strange thing when you face fire trials. So it, we need to be like Daniel and like Joseph if we don't have an alternative Christian society where we are, because they were in a foreign country with no, no believers in God around them. Mm -hmm. But when we are with other believers, we should be promoting, encouraging one another in all the distinctives of what makes Christ's kingdom culture superior and distinct from, from the dominant culture because we need that encouragement from each other. When you're the only one standing for something and everyone's you know, pounding on you saying you're wrong, it, it gets hard, but that's why God gives us the body of Christ. We're all supposed to be saying the same thing that Christ said and the, the word says. And then when we get together or when we don't get together, just knowing that they're there gives us a, more strength in the, in the uh, resistance. Anyway, I know my thoughts were kind of scattered today. I didn't have anything uh, very clearly organized, but um, those are the, th frankly, those are the thoughts I woke up with this morning. I mm. went to bed not having a clue what I was going to talk about today, but I <laughs> just had these thoughts on my mind, so I threw them together in these notes, and uh, I'm aware that they're not very organized. But uh, anyway, anyone have any thoughts, well, questions? Since Rocky? everything's going south with this culture that's dominantly against our Christian view, uh -huh. it almost seems like we will at some point, if not now, we're going to have to get into the political, I mean, we already are. I mean, if you're going to resist mm -hmm. it, we're going to all have to be politically involved or resistant. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to be we're going to be out, happy outspoken at least, and uh, and I believe that voting is a stewardship that we should not neglect. How much more we get involved politically, that is to say running for office or things like that, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to tell people what they should or should not do in that area. So everyone has a different calling. I think some people are called to run for office, yeah. and other people are called to do other things for Christ, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not against that. But when you say we need to get politically involved, I, you know, there's different degrees of involvement that people feel interested in being, and, and others don't. Um, you know, people march against, say, abortion, or they march against this or that wrong in society. And Christians agree with those marchers, but not all are necessarily called to leave what they're doing and march and, you know, and carry signs. Some are, but all Christians have to do what they're called to do and have to do so in faithfulness to to the mission. Now, the mission is not to change America back. It's what we would like to see, and it'll be good for America if it happens, and good for us too. But our mission is to be faithful unto death in proclaiming what's true. Uh, we can't really, we have no guarantees of success in any particular political enterprise, uh, but we have a mandate to be faithful even if we're not apparently successful. Uh, God will succeed, but it may not be in this generation, in this part of the world. You know, the kingdom of God's going to keep growing in China and in Africa and South America. And, uh, you know, it, it may be this part of the world's turn to, you know, to, to go dark, you know, for a, a season. But um, I, I'm not saying it is. All I can say is we have the mandate to be faithful, to be outspoken, to be uncompromised, to live out that culture of the kingdom of God that, that differs from the world's culture. And uh, and pray. Pray that God will turn things around. It seems like that, what you're saying, to live out your faith. I mean, it, it's so much bigger 
in reality that if, if Christians were living like they were yes. real Christians, I think the impact on society would be very different than it is right now. Mm -hmm. and, and if our prayer lives were beefed up a bit, mm. it seems like those two things, I mean, we can protest all we mm -hmm. want, we can, you know, be outspoken, we can do whatever, but if we're not living privately and quietly, truly devoted, and then using whatever gift it is, whether it's prayer or mm -hmm. whatever, if we're not really living the, the way he instructs us, we can say all we want, and I don't think it's going to change yeah. a thing, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, the goal is not to be in a make America a Christian theocracy. Right. It's to walk by faith. And, and have our lives make a difference to the people around us and see us and yeah. change our culture um, by really seeing a real thing rather than a spoken thing mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't know if you know what I mean, but it just, mm -hmm. we can blather it all day long. And we need to be speaking too, but, but our behavior behind that I mean, sort of like this, this issue about marriage and stuff seems to be such a dominant concern of Christians sometimes, and yet the Christian world has kind of gave up the sanctity of marriage. We handed it over, mm -hmm. so why are we so upset with the non-Christian mm -hmm. world? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, we messed that up a long time ago. I mean, yeah. So if we're not living differently, that makes the, the Christian life... A, have evidence of who God is and who he is in our lives, I think we can you, any, yeah, any Christian who divorces their spouse, for example, or any man who doesn't love his wife like Christ loved the church, or any, you know, any any wife who does not seek to be a godly wife to her husband or whatever, or to their children, godly parents, anyone who's not doing their part is kind of surrendering their right to criticize mm -hmm. gay couples or people other perversions of marriage because we're perverting our we're perverting our marriages too saying we know what marriage is supposed to be if we don't do it well then we can't criticize somebody else for not doing what god said they should do in marriage you know if if you it's not enough to just say well at least my marriage is you know heterosexual well that's I'm glad to hear that, but if everything else about the marriage is disobedient to God with reference to his definition of marriage and roles and things like that, how can we criticize people who are contrary to God in their marriages in other ways than ours? I mean, we have to have a platform to speak to the world yeah. from. We just can't go out and talk. We have to have that platform where they, where they can't say, yeah, but look at you, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, they often can. They look at us and go, mm, but that's yeah. what I'm saying. We have to. We have to be able to say, "Yeah, look at me. I'm practicing what I preach." You know, mm -hmm. I never would divorce my wife. You know, I've I've never abandoned my children. I never, you know, beat my wife. I never do the things that I'm saying you shouldn't do. I, you know, and if every Christian was following Christ obediently in those areas, we could say, "Yeah, look at the Christian community here. We don't have those problems you guys have." Who are rejecting Christ. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the Christians who do have those problems, someone in there is rejecting Christ. You know, I mean, if someone walks away from their marriage, they're rejecting Christ. Because you're you're saying, I don't care what Jesus thinks. I know he wants me to say, I don't want I don't I don't care what he thinks. I want what I want. That certainly is a rejection of Christ's lordship. And uh, you know, if we're rejecting Christ, we can't really very well condemn anyone else who's rejecting Christ. We have to be those who are obedient, unmovable from our from Christ's truth and principles and obedient to them. And then we can credibly speak. I'm not saying the world will like it or that they'll accept it, but they can't say, hypocrite, you know, why should we listen to you? They'll have to say, well, you know, I don't want to change the way you want me to change, but I have to admit, you guys are practicing what you preach, you know. I, I was so happy when I learned, my, my older daughter, went through an atheist stage. I don't think she's an atheist now, but <clears throat> she did go through. Yeah. But I just going to say, when she, she was talking about me to someone and they got back to me, she said, my dad, my dad at least practices what he preaches. You know, I thought, 
Well, I'm glad, I'm glad she saw that. I'm glad she believed that because I do try to do that, you know, and, uh, and uh, so your children should, even if they're not believers, they should be able to say, but my parents, they really do live Christ-like lives, you know. Um, I didn't, they, they might say, I didn't want to live that way, but I can't say they're not doing it. You know, they're doing it. They're consistent. That's how it's going to be. Uh, I do want to turn this up to share a story.